Hi folks, my name is Deepak. Uh, uh, Deepak Shinoy, I work with a company called Capital Mind. We do a lot of uh, crazy things with investments. Uh, we're very really happy customers of uh, uh, Satyajit's uh, company, Zeroda as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, payments, investments and the banking system uh, today. So, you know, if you look at the past, uh, like the real, real past, payments, uh, investments were used largely to hide cash. So if I had a lot of black money, I would buy an insurance policy in cash. And then I would keep that insurance policy document with my neighbor. So if they came and raided my house, they would find nothing. And then I could go and take the insurance policy, give it back. They would give me money either in cash or in check or however I wanted it. So uh, this was a law for a long time. Investments were largely used. Uh, most retail level investments were used uh, for... Uh, you know, moving cash around. Now, this whole black money elimination concept was a laugh. You know, people would say, to say <laughs> black money, they're going to eliminate. Come on. So, this is uh, over time, you know, when the government started getting involved and said, you know, we need to stop or slow down some of these uh, uh, mechanisms to hide stuff. We want to know who you are. Largely, a cash investment does not tell you who the person is. So, we need to know who you are, where the investment came from. We need to trace it back. And that uh, soon start setting up into regulations. You can't buy stuff above 50,000 rupees without giving a PAN card. You can't do anything in the stock market with cash, almost. I mean, there are ways, but I won't talk about that here. Uh, but you're, you're typically, as, as people in this room, most likely never going to see cash being used in a stock market uh, uh, transaction. In mutual funds, uh, it gets even worse. I mean, they require not only uh, your, your, I mean, you need to have a bank account in the first place and then a mutual fund uh, set up, which again has no cash in input. Uh, insurance, now they've cut it down a little bit. There is still stuff that you can invest in that uses cash, chit funds, real estate, uh, till November last year. Then uh, I think a few others like PPF, I think you can still go and put about 10,000, 20,000 rupees as cash into a PPF account. That will probably also go away soon. So we are moving towards a uh, low, um, you know, a less cash, more recognized system of investment. The peculiar problem that happens with investments, unlike, you know, if you're a merchant selling like, you know, uh, SD cards, I can pay 2%, my margin's 15%. I can pay 2% for a credit card. I can pay 1% to a debit card. I can't do that for an insurance, uh, for a, for a policy where I don't have that kind of margins or for a mutual fund. You give me a hundred thousand rupees, I'm going to invest it. I can't pay one percent of that to somebody who offers me a payment gateway. The transaction costs of cash have to be very, very narrow. And I think Satyajit mentioned this. One of the things that happens is they can't, they, they charge, they, if you use, if you're a customer of most of the brokerages in India, they will actually charge you money to use a payment gateway to transfer money to them. And that's because there's not, I mean, this is not a business where, you know, you're going to make so much margins that you can subsidize the cost of the transaction. One of the reasons, one of the things that happens because of this is checks become more useful. So you, everything happens with checks. So the broker tells you, give me a check for the amount that you need to pay. A mutual fund is very happy to accept your checks because checks are free. Checks are free by legislation now. Uh, the government has actually set up this whole system that said, I mean, the RBI has set it up saying, listen, checks if are, are, are low, if they are local, you can't charge the customer for them. You can't charge the customer who writes the check. You can't charge the customer who receives the check if it's local. And now because of the check truncation system, everything is local. I'm, uh, no, I won't go into the details of the check truncation system. Essentially, earlier your, um, actual physical check would go to the other bank when you deposited it in your bank. Now what they do is they take a photograph and say, boss, this is what he gave me. I, you just tell me if the signature is okay. And the guy says, okay, signature is okay. And that's fine. So it's like a semi electronic ish mechanism somewhere in the middle that saves a lot of cost. Checks are the costliest uh, form of transaction for a bank, largely because they can't charge you anything for it. Uh, so they have to keep the cost for themselves. The, the bank, um, uh, uh, NEFTs or, or, or IMPS or, RTGS are, are the most other forms of transfer. Now, you can't transfer a large amount by check immediately. A check still takes time to reflect. So, you want real-time transactions, you're going to go through RTGS. Um, UPI, and I'm going to show an example of that. 
so when you have a customer initiated transaction the customer wants to transfer funds to you and he initiates a transfer and then somehow tells you listen i have transferred so much money to you typically that happens with a check you get to know you record the check number you can reconcile you also have producer initiated being a mutual fund you tell a mutual fund you go to a mutual fund website and say i want to pay you 5000 rupees now he initiates a transaction through a payment gateway here they can't accept uh, check uh, sorry uh, credit cards that's for a different reason but they most likely will try to uh, make you go through uh, net banking or i think a debit card now because some there were some transaction costs that have come down substantially and lastly for these sip kind of transactions there is an automated clearing house you take one mandate from your uh, from from the individual who's tran who or they take a mandate from you and then they debit your account every month uh, using this nach mandates the problem with these uh, things is that you know you might have given a mandate 2 years ago it might still be valid and you want to go to your bank and try to reverse it i do not recommend doing this unless you are suicidal actually i do not recommend doing it even if you are suicidal but, uh, uh, but you know it's it's a really bad system because you have to you know you have to go to the bank you have to tell them look i want to stop this thing because if if you actually don't tell them you don't have enough funds in your account the bank will charge you 350 rupees because of low balance and you don't want to get that hit so you want to tell the bank stop this thing and then they will tell you no no you tell the other guy to send me a letter that they will actually stop this thing and then the other guy is from mutual fund and he'll say oh, listen it'll take you 7 days in the middle there's one date in which the check is going or the, the, the transactions happening so you don't want this stuff happening uh, uh, you know you don't want this happening to you so one of the problems with that is this so uh, one of the solutions something like this is upi i mean one of the things that's happening right now and although sebi hasn't really said this is okay this is uh, this is what's happening you know uh, today a lot of a lot of mutual funds and banks kind of try to uh, sit on the edge of regulation so when there isn't a regulation let's see what we can do and sebi comes back and says no 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 you can't do this then we won't do it so idfc has started this concept where you can go to this website uh, you can go to the website it's very strange because you can't do it on the mobile uh, for some reason so you go to the website and you say okay this is my upi id i want to transfer money to you and then they send a you know request to your upi then you have to open your mobile and say okay and then the money goes to them so this is an interesting approach i think it's very early i shouldn't you know say bad things because uh, this is like 15 days old or something but uh, this is an interesting mechanism because instead of doing that regular with this ach mandate where to stop it i have to go to the bank and run through hoops i can actually uh, ask a mutual fund or a or a regular investment product to tell me give me an instruction that you want 15000 rupees per month from me every month it will come as a upi request to me i can just say okay i enter my pin and i'm done this is great because now there is no going back to the bank and saying stop this if i want to stop it i just don't accept the transaction so it's an interesting uh, uh, you know concept one of uh, so this is one thing i mean you you your your uh, uh, this is the inflow part of the equation that means you're investing but whatever money comes out of the financial system is almost always in the banking channel so you'll get checks even from ppf now you will get uh, dividends uh, and interest from companies or from uh, from bonds that you buy or uh, everything comes in electronically or through checks um, in fact the government has actually said that if you if you don't have a dmat account we will actually deduct ask people to deduct tax at source on interest that you receive from certain kinds of products like bonds so if you have a dmat account now a dmat account is another kind of an account where you know you can store all your investments including your mutual funds and so on the the government tries to encourage this in in one place what happens uh, of course you know chit funds and real estate the outflows are also still in cash uh, though i wouldn't recommend it because you know there's a lot of other stuff that 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 happens over there you hold investments in multiple ways now if i were to tell you listen give me this share and i'll give you 50000 rupees 
I end up having some risk and you end up having some risk because you'll say, hey, Deepak Shana said he'll give me 50,000 rupees, but he gave me a check, the check didn't clear. Or I'll say, listen, you gave me some security which was in paper, but it's not really, you know, it's fake. There's a counterparty risk that happens. What if we said instead of you trading with me, there is some guy in the middle called a national stock exchange or a Bombay stock exchange. And uh, there's a clearing, they clear a transaction. They help clear a transaction. So I do a trade with you, you don't, I don't even know who you are. You're mostly anonymous to me. I'll say I want to buy the share, you say you want to sell the share and your shares automatically come in through and my money automatically comes, goes, goes in, goes in through the system. These are called central counterparties. Um, the other kind of counterparties in the system are regulated. And this is very important because, um, uh, you know, every investment product at some level needs some regulation. Otherwise, you don't know where your money is going to go. So, even real estate is getting regulated now. So, a mutual fund, for instance, you just, you can pay a mutual fund. You know what? It will, you will get your money back. Even brokers, although they, some of them have got a bad name. The brokerage system is actually such that you will get your money back if your, your money is in your account. Uh, there is a system that actually says if any broker defaults, we'll pay you back and all of this is electronic. So much of these investment related systems have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, counterparty risk removed. It's similar to perhaps why we go through Flipkart versus going to some other random website and just directly buying products. Because we can trust Flipkart to make sure that if the product is, it doesn't reach us, we'll get our money back and so on. Excuse me. So um, there are many of these, uh, you know, these kind of things in the middle. There are the intermediaries, the clearing agents, um, DMAT agents. And eventually, I think paper holdings will go away. What you can hold as paper, it's called bearer stuff that you can go and give it to a gift to somebody and say, listen, I am this person, give me back the money. That stuff is going to go, that stuff is going to go away. Eventually it's going to be like, I can, you can give me this paper, but I will only return the money to the bank account that was created, that originally funded this transaction. This is great because let's say you die and your children and wife need to, or husband need to uh, find out what you've invested in. If it's in paper, it could be anywhere and they wouldn't be able to find it. But, you know, at this point, uh, they can just go to a single central counterparty and say, listen, with this PAN number, can you, can you tell me what all has been invested and bring it all together? It's bad for privacy because if somebody else did the same thing, they could find out how much money you had invested in what. So there are some good and bad things about it. Right now, things seem to be quite, you know, split between the two. One of the things that, you know, people have done for uh, uh, stuff like this is one-time mandates. So what you do is instead of giving this ACH for every single mutual fund, I want to invest in Reliance mutual fund every month. Uh, I want to invest in IDFC mutual fund every month. That is like two different mandates. You just give it once and your advisor can then split it across onto all of this stuff. So this is interesting because you get one wet signature and then you, you can send, they can send the money to any fund house. I think there's a startup script box which does this in some sort of way. They take one mandate from you and then uh, push, it, push it to different uh, areas. Uh, the RBA hates the fact that you may be able to take credit to invest in stocks specifically. They just hate it. So, because they believe that if you're doing that, you're sort of a quasi-bank of sorts. Okay, so you need to be regulated. So, credit cards, they don't like as acceptance criteria. So, a broker will not accept a credit card. Uh, plus the transaction fees of 2% are too high. Guess what? One of the complications that's happening because I think uh, free charge is trying to uh, partner with a mutual mutual fund to be able to invest is I can use my credit card to put money into free charge, free of charge. And then I can use that money to invest in a mutual fund, which is risk free. And I'll come to why it's some of the uh, mutual funds are very low risk. And then in a month, I can give it back free of charge. And then, you know, you've got, you've got stuff that happens. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm just a little running too slow on this. So I'm going to uh, do this. Uh, last part, and this is interesting. You know, you can ditch a bank. A bank is now abstracted away. Let's say you park your money in these liquid mutual funds. And uh, I'll show you how we can we'll probably discuss this later. But you will know, save 80% of tax if this is money that you're not using. You can just use the interest on this money over time. You can use credit cards to pay for stuff. 
and then you can redeem part of your investments when you want to pay your credit card bill. You can literally get rid of the bank as part of your life. If the, so what's happened now is this, I think the Reliance Mutual Fund that actually gives you a credit card or debit card on your investment itself. So you take a debit card, you swipe it, you use it online, the money comes out of your liquid fund. The liquid funds offer you 7-8% sometimes and these are much better in terms of taxation than your fixed deposit or your savings banks. So it actually becomes a quasi shadow bank of sorts. You've created your own mechanism to do this, but you've gotten rid of the bank. Um, I won't go into this, it's a little complicated. Uh, I think we'll run short of time. I'll go come back to it later, but essentially this is how you save 80% tax. And you, if you took out 2 lakh worth of profit in something where you invested 10 lakh rupees in, you might pay just 10,000 rupees in tax. That's the you know the difference is the in in terms of the taxation that you would you would face. Um, you also have instant redemption. Your your you your on a Sunday you don't have a credit card. You need to use a debit card. Your bank does not have the balance to use it. You can do an instant redemp redemption from your mutual fund. The money comes into your account in five minutes. I think I mean I've done this, so it has come in less than five minutes, so or five seconds. But, and then you can use the money instantly. We use this a lot in our field because we keep, you know, you have idle money all the time because you've sold some investment, you don't have anything new to buy, you just dump it into a liquid fund. And then suddenly some stock falls 30%, you know, oh, we should buy this. But then, you know, then you say, okay, instantly redeem from the mutual fund, buy, put it back into your brokerage account and buy this stock. So we do this uh, uh, instant mechanism quite easily and I'm looking forward to UPI changing some of that as well. Um, okay, you can see this chart of a liquid fund. Okay, so there is some risk involved in liquid funds, but in the last uh, 17 years, there isn't been so much of a risk. You can see that little blip in 2013, little that much. That was the risk uh, that we've seen in these funds, and on average, this thing has returned approximately seven and a half, eight and a half percent in the last five or six years goes up and down based on interest rates as well, but it's never as low as uh, a savings bank account, which is your 4% or, or lower. And <coughs> sorry, you don't, um, it's also great for corporates because you can put money in on a Friday, take, or take it out on a Monday and you'll earn the interest for three days. Find a bank that pays me interest for three days and they won't even talk to you at less than 15 days and less than 15 days, some of them say, I'll give you 1%. I'm like, dude, that I can put it in my savings bank account and you know it will give me more. They like precisely. They don't want the money for like really short periods, but you can use these liquid funds to do that, and the risk is relatively low. Um, effectively, what you're doing when you buy a liquid fund is you're financing a bunch of really large companies or banks. Banks themselves borrow from these wholesale markets where liquid funds give them money. They borrow at about seven, seven and a half, maybe seven percent, which is uh, higher than you would get paid by the bank themselves. And uh, this money is usually available on demand to you. So, uh, you a corporate, for instance, might be able to use this much better uh, uh, because you know you you have the ability to manage your cash much more easily in a shorter span of time. A bank typically earns 3%, they give, they give you 4 or 5 or 6%, they lend out at 11%, 12%. You can do the same thing for yourself and the charges that the liquid fund charges you are approximately 0.5%. So you instead of, you remove the intermediary in this case, he will exist but it is just much more subliminal level. Yeah, that's what I have for you today. Thank you Deepak, can you give him a round of applause Thank please. Do we have any questions? Yeah. <coughs> uh, newbie question. How do I get started uh, with uh, educating myself on equities and mutual funds? And uh, as a, as a, someone who is always in, uh, in like in, in the technology field, how do I become financially literate? Any recommendation on getting started? That's a good uh, that's a good question. I think Zerodha in themselves they have a thing called Zerodha Varsity, 
which has a bunch of, uh, uh, I think, they, they currently text tutorials on a lot of uh, uh, stuff around equity investments. There is uh, the Salman Khan Academy who has some very basic stuff around, uh, sorry, mutual funds and, and structures. Uh, though they are US centric, I think the concept is pretty much the same as in India. There is also, um, you know, the, the problem with it in India is that everything changes every few years. So you build a very complicated commentary about how something works and then they change all the rules. So uh, most of the stuff you will have to find is relatively new but one of the basic things is uh, don't invest in what you don't understand. So try to understand it, you know, I think that's the, that's the bigger thing and uh, some uh, connect with me offline, we have, there's a bunch of videos around Indian mutual funds and Indian equities that can help you get started around of, around of this. And more importantly, if anybody offers you something like a 12% risk-free return, uh, always say no. So, if it's 12%, the risk is free. Is uh, any other questions? Yeah, this one, that's it. How come as a customer I never know about these liquid f funds and where can I find how to invest in liquid funds? Uh, okay, we have a video on this uh, and I can send you the link. But uh, you see this is, this is the stuff banks do and the liquid fund is not bad stuff. So uh, that's why you don't know about it because they don't, they don't want to tell you to for the most part they don't earn any commissions. I mean, if you're charging 0.5%, how much commission will you give? So you you don't get that feedback from them. So liquid funds, you can find uh, information on this on many of the mutual fund websites. IDFC and Reliance have some interesting Reliance mutual funds have some interesting uh, training material on how you can uh, how liquid funds are structured. But um, uh, yeah, you, you connect with me offline, uh, Deepak Shano at CapitalMind.in. I'll send you. Uh, some links and videos as well, I, if, if that helps. Uh, before we take the next question, a very quick announcement. Uh, there's a buff that's going to happen at 4.30 on the point of sale. Online opportunities, offline challenges and will be facilitated by Akash Gehani, Chaitra Sadanand, Raj Brahmanyam and Yashwantas. Uh, any further questions? Yeah, we have a question here. Uh, what is the extra risk that explains this uh, extra return compared to a fixed deposit? What's the extra risk here? So what happens typically is the risk is yours versus the risk is the bank's. <coughs> when I lend, sorry, when I lend to a liquid fund, it can't guarantee me a return. It can't. You just have to look at the past and say, okay, this is approximately what return I can get or look at the market right now. But uh, a bank takes on the risk. So if the guy on the other side defaults, the bank will not say, oh, you know what, he's defaulted, I can't pay you back your money. Here, the liquid fund can say that. So to avoid this, they have a bunch of mechanisms. They, uh, they invest only in paper. Liquid funds only invest in stuff that matures in the next three months. They also invest in hundreds of companies rather than one or two, so that one default is going to be relatively small. That's that little blip that you saw there was when Subarao came one day and said, oh, I'm increasing overnight rates to 12%. So what was 8% became 12%. Even that blip got over in a few days. So that kind of risk is not there for you in a, in a, in a fixed deposit or a bank. But on, uh, because you get paid for that risk, that's an extra percentage point or two that, uh, that you get. Yeah, there's one more question there. <coughs> Excuse um, me. Hey, Deepak, uh, this is Venki. Um, yep. Oh, there you go. Hello. Hey, hey. Uh, quick uh, question now, the mutual funds are all actively managed uh, funds, right? Are there any ETF style uh, funds over here as well? There are. <clears throat> so ETFs are typically in India, um, there are there's equity mutual funds and risk based mutual funds. So you don't have any money market ETFs. There's only one that I know of called liquid bees. Uh, because of the tax structures in India, they the return for you is only 4.5%. Uh, in that particular fund. So it's not very exciting from a return perspective. It's great for us market players to park our excess money for very short periods. But uh, 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 ETFs exist. You can buy them off the market. They're passive, mostly passive investments. Uh, there's about, I think, 
there's ETFs on gold. You can even buy NASDAQ or NASDAQ 100 related ETFs in India. Uh, there's a NASDAQ 100 ETF and because of the rupee going to 70, it's the best performer in the last four years. So uh, they, are, they are available. Uh, just that the liquid part of it is very, very narrow. There's not much there. Any, we will take, you can take one last question. Yeah, you can take one last question. Uh, this is not related to the talk, but general investment question. Uh, my name is Vikas. I'm from Jaipur. Uh, the question is, um, if I have to buy a Facebook stock, what is the easiest way as an Indian citizen to do that? As an Indian citizen, get an account with an international brokerage. Like uh, you can get uh, an account easily with interactive brokers. Uh, there's another broker called Drive Wealth, who's also partnered with Axis Bank to be able to transfer money on uh, through the banking system. Uh, once you get the account online, then you can just, you have to fund your account. Uh, once you fund your account, it, it involves an international transaction. You have to do some paperwork with your bank. After that, you can, it's like an online interface. You just say FB dot buy or whatever. I mean, you just select the ticker and buy it. That's so it. it's Drive Well? Drive Wealth. Drive Wealth. D-R-I-V-E. Okay. W-E-A-L-T-H. So and what's the first one? Uh, interactive Brokers. Okay. Interactive Brokers dot com. These are Indian companies? In These are US companies. Okay. They have an Indian interface. I mean, they, they, they actually work with Indian customers. Uh, if you're an Indian citizen, uh, yes. or an Indian, so if you're not a US citizen, uh, they, the life is a little more complicated because you have to submit some more forms. If you're a US citizen, you just have to give your SSN or whatever it is. I think. No, I mean, the so if I have to fund the account, is there any regulations? I mean, I'll, have, I'll be converting rupees to dollars and then... Yeah, you can't do more than $250,000 a year. Okay. Which if it's not Which a problem, is, then... Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a problem, we can talk later, you know, so... <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Deepak. Please thank give you. him a round of applause.